welcome back to another episode of Haitians in Medicine, brought to you by the Speak Up Network. Today we have Dr. Daniela Lamour, and she is actually a ER resident. Yeah, that's yes. ER residency. Right? First year emergency medicine resident. Yes. yes, she's a first year emergency resident. So, Danny, Danielle. Let's hear your story. So, like, how how long has it, like, since eight years, how long has it been since, like, everything, yeah. and how do you, let's hear your story. Okay. So, honestly, in, in terms of medicine, like, since I was a child, my mom always told me that I was going to be a doctor um, because she's a, she was a nurse, and then she mm-hmm. became a nurse practitioner. So, we were always, like, my siblings and I were always, like, with her, with all of her medical missions, her health care events. Like, she's very active in our community. Is she in Hana? Yes. Oh, my yeah. God. Are you in Hannah? Yes. Well, okay, so one of my friends, her mom is the president of um, the chapter in Fort Lauderdale. Okay, yes. So, she's in Hannah. She's she's a past president of Hannah, too. Oh, wow. Yes. I think, yes. I don't know if the, the, is Fort Lauderdale in Miami the same chapter, but I know. I think know. it is. Well, is it Pauline? Mm, Nadine. Oh, Nadine. Nadine Burrow. I know Nadine, but I didn't know she was a president. She, well, her daughter She's told me she was the president. She, she, no, she, no, she probably is because I know the Miami chapter. I'm not sure about every other chapter, but Nadine is the best. She's oh super humble, sweet. But you yes, see the <laughs> it's very small. It's very small. But yeah, my mom was very active. Well, is very active in that organization. And we were always with her in all of her endeavors. And so I was exposed to medicine since I was a child only because, you know, she was in the field. Um, so I always knew I was going to be a doctor because she told she quite frankly <laughs> imparted that on me. She like I found my identity since I was younger, thankfully mm-hmm. because of my mom. Um, so when I went to undergrad, I already knew like kind of like um, you know how sometimes some people have to kind of figure out what to do because they mm-hmm. don't know. Like it's you're growing, you're a young adult, you don't know. But me, right when I started in my first um, semester at FIU, I actually. Um, volunteered at Mount Sinai Medical Center in mm-hmm. the emergency room. So that's my first experience in the ER. Mm-hmm. Um, I was FIU, by the way, everybody, is Florida International University, and HANA is the Haitian American Nurses Association. Yes. Um, so I started at Mount Sinai Medical Center in the emergency um, room as a volunteer. I did that for 16 weeks, um, and it was so exhilarating so fun like it was just and I was just a volunteer but I'm just looking I was looking at everything like whoa like I love the pace I love the um the continuity I love that people you know you have to be ready for anything that came in the door yeah I I used to work in the trauma well I didn't work in the trauma ER I worked in the trauma ICU slash step down okay so so you're used to the yeah yeah, definitely and then you the acuity I just love that people were just on their feet it was just never a dull moment Mm -hmm. so I was just like well, I think I want to do emergency medicine. Um, so then um, during medical, I mean, during um, undergrad, I did things to get into medical school. Like I became a teacher's assistant. Um, I did, I became a research assistant too, because I just knew like for medicine, you just, there's certain boxes you should check mm-hmm. off for your, to make your application um, stronger. Oh, we'll definitely get into that. Later. Yeah. So I just kind of did all of the steps that I knew I needed to do. Um, like becoming a teacher assistant, I did research, I did a lot of community service um, because Hannah, it was, they always need volunteers. Mm-hmm. I did that through them. And then I became, after I graduated FIU, I became a medical scribe. So that's another thing that can help you become um, a physician. So a medical scribe is basically like a doctor's personal assistant in the ER. Mm-hmm. Or it can be in an urgent care or a primary care setting. So I did it in the ER, and again, I loved it. And then I also did it in an urgent care. Um, and I did that for about a year be- while applying to medical school. Then I got into medical school. Um, that process is super long for anyone who is applying. Um, stay with it. Don't quit. You got this. You will make it in Jesus' name. Um, got in. And medical school, the first two years were, you know, the first two years. <laughs> <laughs> Difficult because it's the book work. You had, like, like in my school, I went to VCOM in South Carolina. That school, you have, like, exams maybe twice to three times a week. So our um, exam schedule is very... Um, tough so you were just always studying so the first two years were just stressful hard 
you were sleep deprived, um, everything that would you imagine in medical school, that's what the first two years was. Then I went into my third and fourth years um, in medical school, and that's my clinical rotation years when you're in the hospital. And that was just so much fun. Like, I loved it. The third year, I came back down to um, South Florida. I was in Wellington Mm -hmm. at Wellington Regional Hospital, and I had a great time. I was under the leadership of Dr. Barry Pierre. He's also a Haitian-American doctor. I've heard of Dr. Barry Pierre. Yes, he has a podcast, too. And he's a program director there at the hospital. So it was amazing being under his leadership, learning, like, what you learned in the first two years, seeing it actually in patients and actually experiencing basically medicine in real life. It was awesome. Um, And then fourth year, we were applying to, you apply to your respective specialty, whatever Mm -hmm. you want to do for residency. And yeah, I did it in emergency medicine. I had a lot of grace and favor. God really put his hand over me through that process. And now I'm here about to start residency as an intern at FAU emergency medicine residency. So you, okay. So you were talking a lot about like how God is favoring you. So you okay. like, so faith pretty much helped you a lot through this whole journey. Okay. That's an understatement. <laughs> like, Oh my gosh, God was like the biggest. He, I, I witnessed him more in my life in medical school than mm-hmm. in any time of my life. Okay, because tell me about it. Like, you know, when you're when you're going through it, when you, I mean, you really could only look up and only it's only God. Like, you could only see, like, all the things you made it through and a lot of things that you just, I didn't have difficulties with because of his grace. He, he was leading me every step. Like, it was, I mean, even going to medical school, I, um, he told me what medical school I was going to. Everything was kind of ordained. And honestly, I just, if I can give you advice, I would say just really lean on to what God wants you to do because he will align your steps. He oh, will definitely. make a way. Like, And he did. It was very evident. Yeah. So, okay. this That was a, like a lot. So, okay. Yeah. So when, okay, let's start from, let's start from the beginning. Yeah. So you said that you volunteered a lot and there were certain boxes that you have to check off as a pre-med student for sure what are some examples of the boxes that you would you would get you would give to someone else who is currently an undergrad trying to do what you're doing what are some of the boxes that you would tell them this check off okay so um there are three main boxes that i would say and then there are some other things that you can do the three main boxes that you just should have as a um pre-medical applicant is research and it doesn't matter what type of research I did my research in psychology some people do it in a biology lab some people do microbiology it really does not matter as long as they see that you are interested in learning more and being uncomfortable that's the whole point of it a lot of people get bogged down with what type of research and this and that whatever you're interested in I say go for it research is very important on your application and I I did that for about I did two di- um, different research experiences. One was for about three months, and another was a year trying to get a publication. So if you can get a publication out of your research, too, even if you're, like, the 10th author, it does not matter. As long as you have that, that's, you're already securing something under your belt. Even mm-hmm. for residency, if you have that um, publication, you don't really have to do as much because you kind of have it already, mm-hmm. like, when you're applying for residency. So that was great. So research, even if you don't have a publication, just get into a lab, any type of lab, um, and get involved so and sometimes you can actually get a recommendation letter from that too um another box i would say is um um volunteering Mm -hmm. so me when i applied to medical school i had a bunch of volunteer hours like over 1500 but you definitely don't need that much i did because again i was involved with the haitian american nurses association via my mom so it was very easy to get volunteer hours when i wasn't doing much i was at their health fair or I was helping pass out book bags because they, they're very active. So I, yeah. So I would say find an organization that you like and just kind of, it doesn't matter if it's, you know, with a summer camp, it doesn't matter if it's with dogs, whatever, as long as you're volunteering and giving back to your community, um, that speaks volumes on your medical school application. Another thing I would say is um, basically just kind of getting out there. Like me, for that looked like a medical scribe. Medical scribe is like a, you don't have to have it, but it looks so good on your application. It's basically a position that you do get paid um, that you can do while in undergrad or after you graduate if you're taking that gap year. I can talk about that gap year a little more later. Um, so a medical scribe, again, is basically a doctor's assistant. Like And, and it's usually used in the ER because it's so fast-paced. They kind of need help charting. So you're just going to be the person 
person charting for the doctor. So you get to go in the patient's room. You get to hear the patient encounter. You document everything that happens from the history, the physical exam, everything that they're ordering in terms of labs and imaging. You literally get to see everything because you're actually clicking all the boxes. So you're learning in the process too. You can ask, hey, why did you order this? What's the rationale with this? I learned so much as a medical scribe that when I was in medical school, mm -hmm. a lot of things made sense. I was like, oh, oh that's, that's a UTI. I've seen that a hundred times. Oh, that's that's a kidney stone. That's you know you you get so much experience that mm -hmm. it's like and it's in your field that you kind of like are you're a step above the rest so to speak. Um, so I would definitely recommend uh, pre medical student to do that and certain organizations or. Um, groups that do that as physicists scribe america you can do low-key scribe jobs like i did it was called clinic um credit care clinics i did that because they paid a little more um, because you're probably you're getting paid minimum wage but because they realize the value of the education you're getting as a scribe mm -hmm. so don't expect much in terms of money <laughs> unless you get like a low-key um scribe job like i did and that was like 15 an hour which is good for like a pre-med student oh, like saving for is. applications so i would say those three um are things that you should be doing um other things to put yourself out there is like medical mission work that also falls onto volunteer. Like I did um, two medical missions with Hannah again. That mm -hmm. was kind of easier for me to do. But I, again, find it an organization. And I mean, even Hannah, if you're willing, you can kind of ask them and they can probably get that started for you but medical mission shows that you're dedicated to people you're willing to get out of your comfort zone you're willing to help people who really need it mm -hmm. um and i feel like during my interviews for medical school they spoke about that a lot oh definitely. so i would say if you can it, it can be pricey to go on a medical mission um, if you can that will help your application and of course the other things like you know have your gpa at um at a decent number and even if your gpa isn't good look for newer schools i would say there's always like kind of a way so you could just find schools that are probably two years three years old oh yeah where there's a will there's a way exactly me. just find a way get a mentor they can help you with that and i would say find someone who is in medical school or graduated medical school because they can vouch for you. Like there's people that contact me and say, Hey, can you like, do you, can you help me get into medical school? And I just make a phone call at my school because, um, our school had some issues with diversity and I made it very clear. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I just feel like if you have a connection with anyone at a school, they can probably just help you get in. And I'll say, Hey, well, you know, I know this person, this person might be great. Even if I don't know you, it's okay. Because I'm, I just want all of us to get there. Um, so find a mentor, find someone who's in medical school, who has done it already, or is in residency, or is a doctor, or, um, an attending physician, and see how they can help. Because you just never know the pool that they have oh, at their school. So, yeah. That's, like, that's really the um, why... Why I even started this podcast? Because like even just before we started, like we realized how we are like our paths probably have crossed. Yes. So it's like people don't understand like the black community is small, the Haitian community is even small. smaller. Absolutely. Even if like I'm originally from this area and you're originally from Miami, like we still probably could have crossed paths. Absolutely. Absolutely. So that's like that's really one of the things that I like I plan to accomplish with mm -hmm. this podcast is to bring people from all like sets of the medical field together because yep. we we do need all, all of us we need each need other, each other. Yeah. absolutely we need each other and it's even evident in medicine we're all in the same setting and we mm -hmm. all have different roles that are super important to each other so if we can learn about our different professions and basically help each other even if i don't know for example i have a friend who's applying to pa school even if i don't know the route i can try to I refer you to someone who does who knows the ropes or i don't know like even just give a recommendation. Um, mm -hmm. It's very important, I think, to just, you know, just talk to each other, cross paths in the Haitian community because, again, we can achieve more together than alone. Definitely. So, so okay, then you started talking about making it to medical school. What was what was your, your defining factor into choosing to be a DO and not an MD? 
Okay. So with that, I was... Oh, wait, sorry. Um, for the listeners who don't know what DO and MD is. So DO is Doctor of Osteopathic Medicine and MD is Medical Doctor. But they both can... They both have the same scope of practice, pretty much. Pretty much. Yeah. So the... Yeah, like so she said, the DO um, degree is a Doctor of Osteopathic Medicine and then the MD degree is a Doctor of Medicine. So the only difference between the degrees is that a DO degree, you have... In addition to what we learned in normal re- uh, medical curriculum, we learned something called osteopathic manipulative medicine. The reason why I chose DO is um, honestly because God told me that's where I'm going. Mm-hmm. So um, I remember when I was applying to medical school, um, I, I, I had like a moment with God saying, you know, hey, God, please help me trust you a little more in this process. I want to go where you want me to go. Like it was just a very deep moment. And then the next day I got a call from my school Mm -hmm. saying, you know, they want to interview me. And then I went to the interview. And then the next day after the interview, I got into the program because it was God told me that's that, that's where I was going to go. He mm-hmm. told me to trust him. And then when I asked him, how can I trust you more? This is the opportunity he presented before me. So that's how I picked my school. But I would just encourage people not to get bogged down. It depends what you want to do. If you're interested in primary care specialties, I think the DO degree will definitely help you in that you can make more money because with the OMM um, skill that we have, you What's could OMM? So that's osteopathic manipulative medicine. Okay. And that's what differs us from the MDs. Um, you basically, it's basically, um, a tech, these, these are techniques to help you, help you as a patient, um, restore your functional and structural issues with just your body. So we learn how to do things with our hands. So just like chiropractors have like manipulative medicines and, you know, they can manipulate your body. Mm -hmm. We kind of do something in the same realm in terms of manipulation, but it's more than that. We work on your muscles. We work on your bones. We work on your, um, skin. We work on your lymphatics. We work on a lot of things that's vital to your overall health as a human being Mm -hmm. so if you were to say you're going to enter a a primary care specialty I would say you can bill more for your OMM um, thing because like our OMM doctors that teaches us they they break down the financial aspect for us and they tell us how you can bill up to a hundred dollars more if you just do these to your patients and it helps them drastically like if you some people come just for manipulation do you know how people just want to just go to a chiropractor for manipulation Mm -hmm. we can do that in addition to traditional medicines and giving you advice and and medicine like pill form so we try to help your body restore its overall health with itself okay so it just depends what you want to do like with me it didn't matter so much because i'm going into emergency medicine Mm -hmm. so i'm not really going to be manipulating people in the er (laughs) because (laughs) you don't have time it's like one minute you gotta figure it out yes so it really just depends what you want to go into but i wouldn't just encourage you to not get bogged down in the degree because you again the scope of practice is the same the pay is the same um so it just depends what you want to do as a physician once you get there so how does it feel now that yeah. you have the like the deal behind your name and you're a resident like how does it feel now compared to like <laughs> when you just started yeah. honestly i feel like i don't have the full weight of it yet because I'm not in the um, medical setting since this coronavirus started. Everything kind of been like at How home. Is that? Yeah. Um, I haven't really experienced it as much because again, school has been virtual. Well, I only had like one more month left of school before it happened. Mm-hmm. But a lot of things have. We've been at home more, so um, I just know that I have it. But <laughs> in terms of the weight and what it feels like, I haven't really experienced it yet. I just know it feels good because all of that sacrifice, everything you've been through, it finally paid off. You finally got what you were working for. You could finally help people. You could finally serve your calling in life. So I'm just excited to start, you know, in my, with my purpose. Like, So in terms of, like, how does it feel? I, I, it feel, It's so many feelings attached to it, but the and most important thing is I just feel blessed. I feel, like, very honored that God chose me to, you know, continue to do this path and to continue in his will and excited for what's to come. Oh, that's good to hear. Yeah. So I know a lot of people, um, so we have a school down here similar to your school called LECOM. Yeah. So how did you like your school and how do you feel like those schools are? Cause those are, those are really, really private compared to like the Nova's yeah. and the um, UN's. Mm-hmm. So how did you like um, Virginia my Carlin? school? Um, so it was, it was, it was a school, I would say. How did I like it? I, I mean, I just went there to do what I had to do. Um, I feel like I would have liked it more if we had more African-Americans in our class. I honestly felt 
like a minority at the school um, because out of 163 um, students in my class, there was only three black um, students. And that was a problem for me um, because we, le- we made up less than half of 1% of the population in our school. So as you can imagine, the stresses that come with being a minority in medicine, everything and asking questions just among your peers. Um, the, I, it, you know, um, I think if that was something that was better handled in terms of the amount of minorities and I'm not going to say minorities, I'm just going to say African-Americans cause there were a good amount of minorities, but mm-hmm. in terms of African-Americans, we were just the least. I felt like I'll be more comfortable if I had people of my own there. Like just to be quite frank, I honestly always feel comfortable. Like I had, of course I had friends, but I just would feel comfortable because we have a different struggle. Oh yeah, I would definitely. say, and I, it would be easier to kind of share that amongst my peers to kind of go through it together. Cause it was only three of us. Um, we managed, um, but, so the school itself, I didn't have any issues, but the the fact that, you know, it was, we had such a small number kind of, that was one thing I d- just really did not like. So um, to combat that, I became a president of one of our organizations at the school, just so that my voice can be heard mm-hmm. um, at the leadership standpoint. Um, I was given access to the dean, to, to many people who can make changes. And um, so we were able to implement some things at the school. We were able to, you know, to basically advance it in terms of um, the minority aspect and specifically the African-American um, aspect. Um, so that's that's what I would say. Other than that, I think my school was good. I got, I got a scholarship going there, which was great. Um, I honestly, so some people would say that, like, if you need help, like, I know some friends of mine who struggled, I don't know if they got a lot of support. So there, if, so if you feel like, you know what type of learner you are. So if Mm -hmm. you feel like you might be, you might fall back and stuff. I'm not sure if there is a lot of support for that because I know that was some of the concerns that were raised. Um, I personally did not experience that, um, but I would just say lean on not only God, but your peers. And if you need help, please don't be afraid to ask for help. I was never the one to be silent when I had a question. Like, if I don't understand something, I'm saying I don't understand something. And I'm raising my hand in front of all 163 people. But I can understand some people will have some issues with that because of the judgment that comes with it and this and that. But me, I, you can think what you want because my grades speak for themselves. So. Mm-hmm. I mean, if I had, like, if I had an issue, I'm going to say, I don't understand. Can you please explain this physiology again? And they would explain. And if I needed extra help, I would go to the um, the professor's offices. Some people are not comfortable doing that, too. So it just really depends on who you are. But I would say, don't worry about what anyone thinks, because at the end of the day, you're working for your degree. And at the end, of, when you're, you get that degree, it's all on you. No one their perceptions of you don't matter anymore. What people think of you don't matter because again, you're going for one purpose. So there are things that can kind of bring you down, but Mm -hmm. yeah, that's the only thing I would say about my school, the minority aspect. So being three out of 163, that's just like a really crazy facing all odds. What are some of the setbacks that you could say that you faced? Okay. So I would think like one of the major setbacks for me is, actually having to leave my home and going away for school mm-hmm. because I went from being dependent to totally independent, having to cook for myself, having to clean for myself, having to do my laundry. I know I'm old and I never did all that <laughs> before medical school. So that was a, an adjustment in itself. Um, and in terms of like another setback, I would say like um, during my second year up there, I um, we we had like some early clinical experiences and that was a good thing my school had in place so that third year wasn't like a big surprise so when I was um going for one of my early third year experiences in the hospital I I guess I was very busy um I didn't eat but I ended up passing out um at the hospital um and I just remember saying hey um, can I step out of the patient room? I felt so hot. Like, I knew I was going to pass out. It's something called mm-hmm. vasovagal. Yeah, so vasovagal response. Yes, so I already knew. And I'm like, can I step out? And then before I knew, I was on the floor, and I woke up, and I just saw all these people surrounding me. So oh, that, just in case anyone wants to know what a vasovagal response yeah. is like, like it's like right after you take, like, a dump and you try to stand <laughs> up, <laughs> that 
like times 10. <laughs> yes. Or like if you see a celebrity, you get so shocked, you pass out. There's just certain things that kind of heighten that, that vagus. It's a nerve that kind of makes you calm down, but mm-hmm. all the way down, you could actually pass out. So, um, yeah. So I just remember waking up to everyone like surrounding me, asking me if I'm okay. So I would say like during medical school, make sure to take care of yourself. Eat. Eat is the ma- most important thing. Eat. Even if you're about to be late. For me, I was about to be late. So I didn't eat breakfast so that was a setback but again it was a setup for a major comeback (laughs) (laughs) so now that we got through that part in med school so when it was finally time to get matched how hard is it to get matched and did you get your first choice for matching okay so um so for people who don't know what matching is when you enter medical school the goal is to get your degree, learn medicine, and match into a specialty that you want or a primary care field. So basically you're applying for your residency spot. Mm -hmm. It's called the match. And for some people, it is difficult. It really depends on you as an applicant, depends on your GPA, depends on your board scores. Board scores are very important. Depends on what you can bring to the, the residency. So for example, if you have like a um, like a 3.0 GPA, and you want to get into dermatology, which is um, a doctor for the skin. Um, it's a very competitive um, specialty, so you're probably not... Okay, let's say your board score, if you want to use the USMLE, is less than a 230, or less than, let's say 250, because it's just such a high specialty. You're probably not going to get in and that will make it more difficult for you to match. So you should know your stats as an applicant to see kind of where you would kind of align and to what respective specialty you want to get into. So if you know you want to get into dermatology, orthopedic surgery, um, H-E-N-T, like ENT, that, um, the ENT doctors, those are very high specialties, and you should probably have the stats to back it up. If you don't, it will be very hard for you to match. Not saying it's impossible because with God, everything is possible. And he really can make a way. But you will struggle a little more if you don't have the stats. For like for emergency medicine, which which I'm, I'm completing, you had you couldn't have below a two thirty um, because it's it's competitive. So those comp- it depends on the competitiveness of the specialty. If it's competitive, mm-hmm. your stats need to be competitive. You as a person need to be competitive. If not, it will be difficult to match. So I feel like if everything kind of aligns, if you have good board scores, good um, GPA, and of other things to enhance your application, you can match successfully. But I do know a lot of people who did have everything checked the boxes and still did not match. Um, it's a formula that none of us really understand mm-hmm. because if you don't match, it doesn't mean you're you weren't smart. It doesn't mean you're not a good doctor. It just just means it didn't work in your favor in terms of. And it's not that people didn't want you. So the way the match works is, the ranking has to kind of align. So. If I rank you my number one, like FAU, emergency medicine um, program, was my number one program. And I knew I was going to go to that program, too, because, again, God told me I was going to go there. Um, So I knew I wouldn't really have difficulties. And for me, I didn't have any difficulties with matching at all because of, again, God's grace. But you have to align the ranking. So if your number one program, for example, like me, is FAU, um, you – you should kind of see if they're going to rank you number one so you can match. Or you could be ranked in their top six first because FAU only accepts six people in emergency oh So you need to kind of see if you have been competing. I, I know. know. It's I'm like, sorry. what's going I'm, on? Guy. I'm just like, I've been competing to do anything there <laughs> since, I, since I got there. <laughs> oh, it's you go there to too? Yeah, so nice. I went to FAU for my undergrad, and then now I'm back there to get my BS in. Awesome. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, but it is, yeah, so it just depends on if you if they rank you high enough to match into their program. So it's like a formula that none of us really understand, Mm -hmm. but there's a YouTube, a good YouTube video on it. It is difficult depending on your stats, but definitely possible. If you're doing well as a medical student, you shouldn't have any issues matching, but again, you still can. So, so how long is residency for those people who don't know, like the time after medical school that you're taking to learn the new skills? Okay. So for emergency medicine is three years. It depends what you want to do. If you want to do general surgery, that's five years. 
um, most primary care specialties like peds, internal medicine, and family medicine is three years. Um, dermatology is four years, one year intern. So depending what you want to do, the the length of time of residency um, differs. But even in emergency medicine, there's some programs that are three years and some that are four years. So. Mm, wait, why the why the why some of them are three and some of them are four? Um, do they do the same I, thing or? So the extra year they act as an attending physician. So an attending physician is basically when you're complete when you're completely finished um you're out of residency training and you're on your own so they say they act as a senior it's extra years for research if you want to do basically everything i'm not interested in <laughs> so <laughs> i'm like i'm not doing four if i can do three okay. so yeah so what were some of the experiences that you had in med school that like that sh are shaping you right now okay so um one of the most remarkable experiences I had in med school was when I was actually doing my audition rotation at FAU during my fourth year, basically auditioning to get into that residency program. Mm -hmm. So um, at, for those who don't know, FAU's um, emergency medicine programs are um, under the hospitals of Bethesda Hospital East and Delray Medical and um, St. Mary's. Um, but in that um, region, there's a large Haitian population, which is why I honestly ranked that as my number one choice too because I just really felt at home and I felt like I was helping my own people and I had a particular patient I remember she came in and, and as a medical student you um, go see the patient first and then you present it to your um, attending physician so when I went to see her the chief complaint was abdominal pain so I was asking her to basically elaborate on her pain um, what basically brought her to the ER mm -hmm. and then she basically went um on a tangent explaining the cause of what she thought was her abdominal pain, which was that um, she was sleeping and then she had a dream that a snake entered her stomach and some, someone told her that this was going to happen. And then she woke up with this pain that's going to kill her because the snake is inside of her going to kill her. And I'm like, okay, mommy, okay, <laughs> <laughs> to be quite frank, you, you, that's not, I cannot help you with that. Um, I said, did you eat something? You know, trying to, you know, reframe the question. Did you eat something different? Did anything happen out of order? No, I'm telling you. It was the dream, and this is what happened, and this I'm telling you, you have to fix. And I'm like, you know, we can't really help with that. And I don't want you to tell the attending physician that because, of course, it's a cultural thing. Mm -hmm. Not everyone's going to understand that, you know, basically that cultural aspect of it. And I'm just like, you know, just – just allow us to do certain testing because she was adamant that we had to get the snake out. And of course, you know, there's no snake and we can't get it out. <laughs> so I'm just, I just had to convince her to just let us do some testing and let us do, you know, kind of further see what the cause of her, um, her stomach pain was. And of course it was gastritis. So it was no snake, but it just shows you the um, cultural differences in medicine and how people think differently and how it influences their response to healthcare in terms of, accepting what the doctor will do, what medications to give. And I think understanding those cultural biases is important as a physician, which is why it is important for more Haitian American doctors to come into the medical field um, so that we can kind of be that voice of reason for our patients. Definitely. So what advice would you give to someone who is like looking at you right now and they're like, oh my gosh, I want to be just like her? Um, my advice is that you definitely can be like, it's, it's, um, I'm not an anomaly, like with God, all things are possible. And if you really want it, please do it. It doesn't matter what comes in your way. Like not everyone's path is straight. Everyone's path looks different. In my class, there was a 46 year old. There was a person who applied eight times and finally got in. There are many different people that make up the field of medicine. And just because, if you, just because you feel that you may not look like the traditional applicant, please don't let that discourage you. I think you should just go for it. With me, honestly, my mentality was to get through with school and then be done. So after undergrad, I went to medical school and I'm doing residency. I didn't really do a lot of extra in between. But if you want to, again, please do. Um, I honestly just say, don't let anything stop you. Like, if this is your calling, God told you to do this, you're going to do it. Like, he's going to make a way like he did in my life, and he's going to give you the favor and the access. He's going to open doors for you to do it. So I would just say stay close to God because he, again, will align your steps. He will tell you where to go, mm -hmm. and it will happen. I believe in Jesus' name it will happen. If God tells you it's going to happen, it's going to happen. So if you want to be a physician, you can do it, and hopefully you choose ER. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> even if you don't, I still love you. <laughs> So let the people know where to find you on social media. Okay, on social media, um, you can follow me 
on, on Instagram, you can follow me at just being Danny. So it's J U S B E I N G underscore D A N N I. And um, Facebook, it's Daniela Lamour. So D A N I E L L A. Last name Lamour, L A M O U R. So, like, do you have any upcoming projects that you want to promote while you're here? Or anything you want to talk about? Like, Nope. Just preparing for residency during this pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's going to be a long. Invest, in, invest okay. in, a, in a, what's that thing? The little the the gas mask. Oh, the gas mask. Yeah, my brother bought us one, but I never wear it. Cause it's Girl, like, um, yeah. that's what we have to literally wear. And, like, I don't know if you see this mark on my face. That's where I got it from. Oh, like, yeah. Literally. Taking oh off, gosh. putting on, taking off, putting on, like it literally it destroyed my face. But I make yeah. sure to do a mask every night now. I can't be doing that now. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not ready for all that, but of course I have to be, so I got to throw the advice in there. Yeah. So thank you guys for listening again today. We had Dr. Daniela Lamour, and she spoke about her journey in med school, journey to residency. And make sure you guys listen to us weekly at Haitians in Medicine on Instagram, Spotify, iTunes, and YouTube at Blada Knows Best. Thank you. Bye. Bye.